Okay. Welcome to another edition of Nationally Syndicated, Exploring Mind and Body. We're super excited to welcome a brand new guest. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Biamonte. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be here. Yes, we're excited. we got a, a super important topic to get into. So why don't we get a chance to resonate with you a little bit, give our audience a chance to know who they're listening to. Well, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm a certified clinical nutritionist by New York State. I've been doing this work since 1982. So I know my way around the around the block a little bit. And I'm, I want to take up something that you and I were just actually mentioning. It's actually a crime, I think, that a gynecologist doesn't totally understand the effects of the biome on a female patient. And why I say it's a crime is because they're overlooking a, a very important piece of data that has an intricate function in a woman's hormones. Most people don't know this, but your, your microbiome actually helps to regulate your hormones. And it does that by shuttling hormones in and out of the intestinal tract, in from the bloodstream into the intestinal tract and back and forth. That's one of the regu regulating mechanisms of hormones. It's not just that a, a, a gland secretes or doesn't. It's that once the hormone is secreted into the bloodstream, the biome regulates not only the exchange of that hormone in and out of the bloodstream back to the intestinal tract, but also the down regulation of the hormone, meaning breaking it down because hormones after, a, after a while have to be detoxified. They just can't keep circulating forever. Otherwise they'll cause a lot of um, problems and illnesses. Say that again. What needs to be detoxified? H hormones do. Okay. And how do we do that? You do that through your biome bifidobacteria in your colon working in conjunction with glutathione in your liver. That's how you break down hormones. And then there are different enzymes depending on the, the hormone. Like for instance, with estrogen, there are copper-based enzymes that break the estrogen down fully. With progesterone, it's zinc-based enzymes that break it down. With testosterone, it's manganese-based enzymes. So each, each hormone has a list of vitamins, minerals, amino acids that it will partner with in order to function and be biologically active. And all those hormones also have to be broken down correctly. Otherwise they will cause trouble. When you, if you take um, estradiol, for instance, which is the most active form of estrogen. And after, after a certain point, the body has to break that estradiol down to deactivate it. And if it's not fully deactivated, it, you'll get substrates of the hormone lingering in your system, which can start to cause inflammation and irritation to different parts of the body. And when you're dealing with a woman who's, especially a woman who's still menstruating, the PMS can be a really volatile issue with women. I mean, it's, it's fine. We have a lot of locker room jokes about it, but in reality, if you understand what's happening when you're PMS, PMSing is you're actually in a, in a state of estrogen dominance at that time. And estrogen is an inflammatory hormone. Yes, estrogen is responsible for making a fetus grow, but it also makes other things grow. Estrogen is similar in a sense to growth hormone in that it will stimulate the growth of certain tissues, like a fetus, like a baby, but also cancer cells. And in doing that, it also creates inflammation, which is why women feel, feel the way they do when they're, when they're PMSing. Most of the symptoms they have are all inflammatory. And the, the biome, helping the biome regulate this is really important. It gets overlooked all the time. In some cases, women can do better in trying to regulate their hormones by getting their biome corrected than by taking all types of um, natural hormone replacement therapy. Yes, that's what I want to hear. So what is, let's get into it. What are some of the things they can do to correct that? The first thing they have to do is disinfect their biome of any pathogenic organisms, which actually interact with estrogen. And the major one is candida albicans. Can, candida is highly estrogenic. Candida itself responds to estrogen. Estrogen stimulates the growth of candida. And candida also stimulates the estrogen receptor sites in your body to make estrogen have a greater impact on you. That's the number one enemy 
and the woman's biome is candida because of the fact that it over amplifies the effects of estrogen. So why don't we explain some of our listeners might not know what that is? Well, candida is a normal inhabitant of your biome. Candida is a fungus, which is often thought of as being a chameleon because it can flip itself at will from being a fungus to a yeast. Candida is the yeast that's responsible for vaginal yeast infections for most for men who have jock itch and groin rashes. When people get thrush, people who are immune suppressed, when they get thrush and their mouth turns white and they, it's painful to swallow and whatnot, that's also candida. Um, candida is most famous, though, for causing vaginal yeast infections. It's a normal part of your intestinal flora, but it's a subdominant part. Candida is there to help stimulate your immune system and other friendly bacterial organisms feed off candida, use it as a food. When something happens to disturb the food chain in your intestinal tract, meaning the, let's, let's say, we'll refer to it for a, for a second as the good biome. When, when the good flora that normally controls candida is compromised, then candida is allowed to grow out of control. And candida then becomes a dominant part of your flora. And when that happens, that's when it's in a position to stimulate these estrogenic effects. So what is, what is it that keeps candida in place? Balanced. What keeps yeah. candida under control are two, mainly two bacteria, um, which are gram positive and are considered to be part of your uh, major constituent of your flora. One is called acidophilus, lactobacillus acidophilus. And the other is lactobacillus bifidus. Acidophilus lives in your intestines, your small intestine, and bifidus lives in your colon. And that's basically the mechanism. Those two bacteria keep candida under control. And when anything happens to compromise those two bacteria, the candida will then start to grow and become dominant where it should not. Okay, so those ones in there in particular, we have to do something talking about di proper digestion, food intake, et cetera, to make sure that those are functioning properly. Yeah, well, or we have to make sure we avoid anything that's gonna compromise them, which the number one hit parade are antibiotics. Hmm. The use of broad spectrum antibiotics, in fact, to quote the Merck manual, the indiscriminate use of broad spectrum antibiotics is what compromises and kills those bacteria that normally control candida. So a big, uh, a, one of the major fallacies is when you have a, a flu, which is a virus, right? And you go to the doctor because you have a cold or a flu. Well, 90% of the time, what does the doctor do? He gives you antibiotics. Now, you think about it for a second. Now, why would he do that when an antibiotic has no effect on a virus or a flu? A virus laughs at antibiotics. Antibiotics only kill bacteria. The flu or the cold is not a bacteria, it's a virus. Why he's giving you the antibiotic is to try to kill any secondary infection that occurs as a result of having the influenza or, or the flu. But it's damaging your biome. Right, so this is, a cha this is challenging. Uh, do you work with individual clients? Yes. Okay, so this is a challenge for us as well. Like when we, we're talking about natural holistic ways to improve your health, we talk about this in particular, but the challenge is so many people are on different pharmaceuticals, including antibiotics. So what do you do or how can you explain that that may not be the best answer for you? The first thing you do is you, you teach them that antibiotics have no effect on a virus. So if the doctor is giving you an antibiotic for a virus situation, he doesn't know what he's doing. At best, what he's trying to do is cover his tracks so that you don't get a secondary infection from having the flu. Uh, when you let's look at a flu, for instance, a flu, which is a, which is a virus, begins with muscle aches and pains, headaches, feverish. That's the viral stage of a flu. The second stage of the flu is we refer to as the bacterial stage. That's at that time you're starting to get yellow green discharge. This is where bacteria are now jumping into the to the fight and they're causing a secondary bacterial infection. To take antibiotics, the, the doctor's reasoning, he gives you an antibiotic and he's knocking out the second stage of the, of the flu, which is actually the bacterial stage. You're better off letting it run its course because those, those antibiotics are going to kill your flora. 
and now you're going to have compromised floor, and now you're going to get candida. So what the options always are to go with something natural rather than something that's pharmaceutical, which if used indiscriminately has too many side effects. Right. And then so what you're talking about here is what we've seen more than ever seemingly is people are not not just not feeling well, but they're not feeling well longer than ever before. So more people oh, yeah. it seems to be more frequently and then the duration is being extended. Well, there are many reasons for that. G eating GMO foods, big reason. GMO foods are one of the most hidden traps out there. Most people don't understand what they are, but essentially GMO foods are the brainchild of a company called Monsanto, which I call the corporation from hell. And Monsanto makes these genet genetically modified foods because it's cheaper. There's a lot of reasons from a business standpoint why genetically modified foods are good for those that business. But your body's, your body's DNA can't figure out what the hell the genetically modified foods are. Genetically modified foods are another thing after year of year and year of consumption, which kill your biome. Not to mention the fact they've been banned at most, in, most throughout Europe because they cause different types of cancers. And right, in, the, in America, they refuse to look at those studies, but Europe has banned them. Yeah, same as Canada. No different here. So, so that's that's one thing. The other thing is you have you have various pollution. You have various additives in foods. There's there are a lot of reasons why people are or their immune systems are depressed. If you look at the the environment and the chemicals you're exposed to, just the amount of plastics like, which people are exposed to, which again are highly estrogenic themselves. Oh boy, there's so much we could talk about. So how yeah, do there we... is. That's true. <laughs> So how do we, okay, let's talk about plastics here briefly, because this is something I really dislike. How can we start removing plastics out of our life? You just simply use glass as an alternative. That's what I did. That's what my wife and I did in, in our home. Instead of having water bottles that are, that are plastic, we have glass. You know, so we just try to shift everything over. My wife put special containers to store leftovers and whatnot that are glass, not plastic. Yeah. That's what you have to do, because it's a people are getting bombarded. You know, I'll, I'll get, jump for a second to a, a different way of looking at this, autism. 200 years ago, people didn't know what autism was. And one of the reasons why is not so much because socially it wasn't dictated. It's because kids who have autism are bad detoxifiers. When you do genetic testing on these kids, you find they have all the SNPs that are the, the SNPs that lead to improper detoxification. So kids with autism don't detoxify well. And why, how they get into the autism scene is they become overloaded with toxins that didn't exist 200 years ago. 200 years ago, you didn't have mercury, you didn't have thimerosal and vaccines that people were getting. You didn't have all the different toxins in the air. Basically, a kid with autism is a kid who can't detoxify and his body's overloaded with toxins and it then affects him neuro neurologically. Wow, that's a lot. That's, that's heavy. So that's a that's a slice of how toxic, you know, we are on this planet. We're very toxic. It goes way beyond global warming. So global well, warming is a joke compared to the amount of toxins the av average person is exposed to. So what are some action steps we can do? We talked about again. You got your biome. Your biome is so important because your the bifidus bacteria in your colon works closely with glutathione in your liver. And that's your major detoxification engine right there. People who, de who do things to detoxify themselves, who take supplements, herbs, do cleanses or whatever, usually are going to be in a far better place than the average American who's at McDonald's. So, okay. So we're looking at um, paying attention to antibiotics, avoiding plastics. Mm -hmm. um, what else can we do to detox the body to make sure we're on the right path or to improve that uh, gut microbiome? Well, the first thing, the first thing I think people should do, and um, hopefully someday this will happen, is you go to a functional medical doctor or a functional nutritionist and you get tested. It's very simple. And there's enough of us out there right now where people can go and it's not a, it's not a mystery. You can find doctors like myself on the internet. You can find them in your own hometown. Just do a Google search. 
You go to the doctor. The doctor is going to do different tests on you. He's going to test your biome. He's going to test all your levels of nutrients. And he's also going to do genetic tests on you. And we, we sort of use these together. The genetic test shows us what your inherent weaknesses are from your family line and what could happen to you if you're under the, enough stress and, and get hit with enough toxicity. The other tests are showing what's happening to you now in real time. So a skilled practitioner can play these tests off each other. He can look and see what you're, what you're prone to and then look in your other tests to see if that's possible that that could happen now. And this is what the doctor of the future, I believe, should be doing. He should test people genetically to see what they're prone towards and then do tests to show what their health is doing in real time and compare them to each other. This way he knows that he can adjust the person's biochemistry to prevent the weaknesses in their genetics from actually happening. Right. So we were using current data and then data that could be Genetic happening in data. the future. Yep. Right. Yeah. That's what I believe the doctor of the future should be doing rather than trying to push statin drugs or so, a whole line of drugs, you could say. And is this a, do you think people are becoming more open to? Oh yeah, different... absolutely. Absolutely. Like if you look at the numbers, the health foods, the health food industry is now risen to be a billion dollar industry, billions of dollars in health food where, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was some people eating, eating granola. <laughs> you know, it's it's tr there's a tremendous difference now in the awareness. Now, if you go, um, if you turn on the TV, you'll get you get bombarded with with um, commercials about vitamins and about different probiotics. So it's an embarrassment now when someone doesn't know that when you go to a medical doctor nowadays and you start talking about these things that you're seeing on TV, he, he will be embarrassed if he doesn't know about it. So they're 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 having to learn and get hip. And, and see what's going on because it's, it's, it's intricate to what's happening with people's health comparatively to watching a commercial about some drug where they go on for 20 minutes about the side effects, you know, <laughs> all that, those tiny fast words that they're saying really, really yeah. quickly at the end of the ad. <laughs> yeah. It's hysterical. So, so for, I guess I so watch these commercials and I'm saying, myself, I can't wait to get on that drug. I can't wait to become impotent and half blind and all the other things that are going to happen. <laughs> so, okay. So we got to start taking action and we got to take control of our health. That's what we got to do. And we have to try to avoid pharmaceuticals as much as possible because what people have to understand is that it's a scam. And the biggest scam is psychopharmaceuticals because there is no evidence that, that these drugs, these psychiatric drugs do anything beneficial. They, the doctors keep throwing around this term, a chemical imbalance in your brain. Do you know that there is not one study that has proved that? If you, if you hear a psychiatrist go on about how you have to take Prozac because you have a chemical imbalance, ask him, what is the study that proved the chemical imbalance existed? Can't answer you. He'll give you a no answer. He'll go hide in the closet because there is no There has been no study that proves there is a chemical imbalance. And if people really understood how SSRIs work, they'd be shocked. SSRIs don't raise your serotonin. What, the, it's, what, the, what they are is they are serotonin uptake inhibitors. They block the reuptake of serotonin into your brain. This is why so many people, when, when they do um, the trials, actually commit suicide or are far worse. What, if you notice, when you hear... Um, when you have these commercials come on up for Cymbalta or any of these SSRIs, you'll hear them talk about increased suicidal thoughts. Now, how could that happen if this is a drug that's supposed to be doing the opposite? Well, the reason why is because an SSRI blocks serotonin uptake into your brain. It's actually cutting it off. It's not raising it. Everyone thinks it, it would be intuitive to think that it would increase it, but it doesn't. It blocks it. And the reason why it blocks it is because when you start to lower or cut that serotonin in your brain down, the serotonin receptor sites become more active. And that's actually how those drugs work. So and going, going back to women, now here's the, here's the big problem I have. You have women with bad PMS, and what happens? They end up getting put on these drugs. 
They end up going on Prozac. They end up going on all these psychopharmaceutical drugs where there's really no evidence on how they work. And women, because of having PMS, where again, they're estrogen dominant at that time, end up going on these drugs as Band-Aids. Rather than correcting their biome or correcting the balance of their hormones, they get put on these drugs. So when we correct our biome, so during the, the a PMS stage, mm-hmm. if that, if that um, estrogen levels are lower right. by correcting the microbiome, is there right. less side effects? Yes, million, a million times. So less night sweats, less. Yes. And there are a lot of simple things women can do on their own. Simply taking vitamin B6 and zinc during your menstrual cycle and the magnesium can those three things, magnesium, B6 and zinc can dramatically improve your PMS. Now you can get into a, a larger program of that, you know, to also take current seed oil and a lot of other things. But just those three things can make a huge difference in a woman's life. Magnesium, B6, and zinc. That helps That helps regulate a lot of the symptoms and it helps regulate the estrogen to progesterone balance. Taking probiotics, a woman, again. Now, the caveat with regarding probiotics is that if a woman already has an existing candida overgrowth, the probiotics don't really help much. They only help at the time you're taking them. You have to eliminate the candida and then reimplant the probiotics. It's like a game of musical chairs. Once the candida is there, it's not going to go away. You've got to get the candida out of there and then put the probiotics in, and then that will normally help regulate your biome and regulate your hormones. That's the only thing. I don't want people to take probiotics and then become disappointed because they're not going to get a good response if they do have candida. What is the... um? I got two questions I really want to ask. How do they know they have candida? And I want to know what type of probiotics you recommend. Well, let me ask, let me answer the, the second question first, because it's, there's a whole chain of um, nonsense connected to that. The uh, companies argue with each other or try to outdo each other in terms of how many, how many strains the, the probiotics has. It has 5 billion strains and it has this strain and that strain and the other, all these exotic strains. The truth is, if you establish your normal basic bifidobacteria in your colon and acidophilus in your small intestine, all of these other fancy strains that they argue about naturally come about because that's how they came about into nature in the first place. You see, they're, they're natural beneficial mutations that occur within the family of acidophilus and bifidus. So to worry about what probiotic I have to take, because it has this strain, that strain, this product doesn't have that strain. This one has these two. It's nonsense. Just reestablish your lactobacillus, acidophilus, and your bifidus, and all of these other fancy strains are just going to um, mutate in a good way and reoccur in your intestines. That's the first thing as far as that goes. Um As far as what I recommend is I just recommend a probiotic, which is called a sticky strain or human strain. Those are industry terms. And those are the probiotics that really work. Because a human strain or sticky strain literally does stick to the lining of your intestine, where other strains that aren't human strain don't. They just pass through your system and they end up in the toilet. Okay, so... What what is, is there a name brand? Is there these are supplements you're getting from? Yes, food? actually, there is. I'll, I'll I'll be happy to throw a, a pitch in. There's um the the brand that I mostly use with my patients is Metagenics. And why is that? Because uh, Meta, Metagenics pioneered the um in the industry sticky strain bacteria as a product, engineering it so that it would last in the bottle and and whatnot. So, okay, what about uh, fermented foods or getting probiotics from food sources as opposed to a... Sure, supplement? that helps. Kim, kimchi and sauerkraut and all those things, they definitely help. Okay, but so you see, all, but all of it, is, all of it is, is a waste if the person happens to have a candida overgrowth. Right. Okay. So back to your question, how do you know if you do? There are certain key symptoms of candida. Unfortunately, there are so many symptoms we could be here for years... But, but there are some basic ones that typically occur in people. But 
more important than that is looking at a timeline for the person to see if there is a logical sequence of events that might have then ended them ended given given them this condition. So normally people will develop candida when they've taken antibiotics, when they've taken steroid medications, if they have taken a lot of antacid medications, um, if they had chemotherapy or any immune suppressing medications, if they were in an accident. Any strong stress to the body, even oral surgery, can stimulate candida overgrowth because of the trauma going down the whole alimentary canal. So that's the first thing, is you look for a, 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 a trigger. Second thing is, what are the symptoms? Usually, candida begins by the person starting to feel tired, more tired than usual, and they start noticing cognitively they're not as sharp as they normally would be. They forget names. They, they walk into a room and they say, why am I in this room? What did I come in here for? I, I, don't, I don't remember. Then they start developing digestive problems, bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea. Then they can start becoming more allergic than normal. They can start developing rashes. Women can now start getting vaginal yeast infections. Men can get jock itch. Um, they start noticing they react weirdly to certain foods, especially foods that have yeast, particularly bread, um, beer. Um, there are people who, with candida who will drink one beer and, be, and have to go home and go to bed. So you'll get these symptoms starting now. When candida becomes very severe, it starts to imbalance your hormones. And then it also starts to make you extremely chemically overloaded or sensitive. We used to call this years ago a universal reactor. This is somebody who's basically so toxic that he's reacting to everything in his environment. They can't go to the to the supermarket and walk down the aisle where they have because all the, the smells of those chemicals will freak them out. They can't go to a bar and sit down where people are smoking and they're wearing perfume. They can't do it. They'll get over, oh, incredibly sick. So that's at the higher end of the symptoms of candida. Yeah. So, OK, so it could be a lot of different things. It's hard yep. to put your finger on it. It's hard to put your finger on. Yeah. OK, but but a person could figure it out if a person r realizes that they're starting to have a lot of these symptoms that are all disjointed and don't make sense. And then they say to the, they hear a podcast like this and they go, wow, maybe that's candida I have. If then they go back and they think about when did all these symptoms begin, like try to spot a time that didn't have these symptoms and then move forward. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, gee, that, well, that's when I had my wisdom teeth removed and I had all those antibiotics. And it was after that point that I started to feel this way. So now they've got something. So what if they're in a situation like that and like they don't know any different or they feel strongly that they, they should take that recommendation of antibiotics? How do you flush that out? We talked about detoxing a bit at the beginning. You, so you've taken antibiotics. What can you do? Well, there's nothing you can do. The, the, the horse is out of the barn. But if, if we back up for a little bit, there are a lot of alternatives to antibiotics that work arguably better. There are different types of colloidal silver on the marketplace now, which don't have any side effects where they would normally in the old days produce this gray blue tint to your skin if you took too much of it. They don't do that anymore. And some of these silvers are more effective than antibiotics. There's oil of oregano which is a very effective antibiotic there. And the list goes on and on and on. There are a lot of, if a person goes to the health food store, spends a little time there looking around and asking questions, they, they can assemble a medicine chest, which can be virtually all natural. In fact, I wrote an article 20 years ago. It was called your medicine chest can be natural. And I explained how everything in your medicine chest could be substituted for a health food store item that doesn't have the side effects. Okay. This is great, but I do have to start wrapping things up here. Anything that we, anything we missed you wanted to mention? Well, if, if we're looking again, looking at women, I would say if, if we're going to look at that point, which is sort of what we've been, we've been focusing on, it's, it's very important that a woman find a functional medical doctor who understands the effects of their, of the biome on her hormones and it's extremely important that women refuse to take dr unnecessary drugs 
Like one of the, the biggest one of the biggest crimes I could imagine is a woman who's PMSing who goes to the doctor and the doctor wants to put her on psych drugs because she's PMSing. He should be doing something to correct her hormone balance, her hormonal imbalance, not putting her on psych drugs. Yeah, and then you get stuck on those, right? Like you got you get addicted to them, right? Yeah, you can. So or maybe that's more pain medication. No, it's it's psychiatric drugs. You get addicted to them because they're in, they're actually causing a, a, a deliberate imbalance in your neurotransmitters to try to make a person feel differently. And once they do that, your but there's a thing, there's a, a, a phenomenon called homeostasis, which everybody studies if you go to medical school or even in high school if you study biology. Homeostasis means the body's trying to hold something in a in a stable place. Once the body gets used to doing something, unfortunately, even if it's the wrong thing, that becomes its stable datum, and that's the way it's going to stay until you know how to unravel that. So well, when people go on those drugs, they have trouble getting off of them because now their body's used to how that drug has their body working. That's why you never want to get on them in the first place. Okay. Uh, how do we get a hold of you? Website. Yeah. Um, uh, my website is health-truth.com. I have two other websites, the New York City Thyroid Doctor and the New York City Candida Doctor. They can find me at those either of those three websites. So what are you doing? Like this is radio. This is podcast. People are all over. Are we, you able to work with people online? What, yep. I on? actually only work with people virtually now. Um, there, there was a time where we had, you know, all these people in our office. We don't do that anymore. We found it to be inefficient. We found it's much more efficient to work with people virtually. I did my first phone consultation in 1987 with, with a patient because the patient was being referred by a, 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 a local person. They lived in Texas. They said, there aren't any doctors like you in, in Texas. Can you help my uncle? So we, I spoke to him on the phone and that was the first one. And you know, now we, with the help of the internet, now we're a hundred percent virtual. Awesome. Okay, so we can reach you. They go to your one of your websites. They can yep. if they want to find out more details. They can read or hit the contact page, and there you go. And there they go. Yep. Do, uh, Dr. Bill Monte, that was fire. Thank you so much. I love that interview. Appreciate your time. Yeah, my pleasure.